everyone. So I am third slash fourth generation Mexican American. I'm third generation on my father's side and I am fourth generation on my mother's side. But I was raised completely away from my culture. In fact, um, I have never really felt like I belonged anywhere. Uh, I grew up in an affluent home in North Dallas. In fact, we were the first minorities to actually move into the suburb. And for a long time, I knew we were always suspect. Uh, I used to joke with my dad that they must think we're drug dealers or something. Um, and in the 80s, my dad had those ostentatious Cadillacs with the gold package. So I could kind of see where that assumption might come from. I also noticed that the little girl that I played with next door, it took 10 years before the mother actually came to our front door and asked my mother out for lunch. So growing up, I have never really belonged here and I have never really belonged there. I'd like to share this quote with you from um, one of the groundbreaking scholars in Chicano studies. This is Gloria N. Zandula, and she wrote a watershed work called La Frontera from the Borderlands. And the quote is, the U.S.-Mexican border is una rierda abrieta, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. And when you think about the first and the second generations that come to this country, they very much live in the borderlands. They are no longer part of their country of origin, and they're not really considered American yet either. So the term that's thrown around quite a bit is the term Chicano. So let me explain what Chicano is. To be Chicano, you're usually from uh, Mexico. You're usually the first or you're the second in your family to have been brought to the US and raised uh, in, in American uh, society. Um, a lot of times this word Chicano has derogatory terms like, oh, my dad used to say, oh, I'm just a dumb Chicano, what do I know? Um, it, for generations, it was a way to kind of, you know, describe a marginalized group. In the 60s, though, the word Chicano became politicized. Uh, if you know, um, activists like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta became a way to rally migrant workers to fight for rights of individuals. So the term has kind of had this ebb and this flow. Uh, even in literature, Chicano literature, most of the stories are about that first and second generation experience. Some of you may know some of these works, Barrio Boy, for example, or The House on Mango Street, and they talk about trying to live between these two very different cultures. But my question is, what happens when you're not first or second generation? Um, and what happens in, with those first two, they tend to focus more on assimilating, trying to be more American, and they actually move away from their mother culture. And there is a lot of pressure to kind of walk away from that. Uh, if you saw in the 60s in California, if you dared to speak Spanish in the high school, you were kicked out. So in the 60s and the 70s, there was this sense of shame to speak Spanish in public. And one of the reasons why I was not taught Spanish at home growing up is because my parents did not want me to have that stigma. They did not want me to have an accent. They did not want me to be judged um, by these outside pressures. Well, when you think about assimilating, the first way I would look at this is, well, I didn't even realize I had already been assimilated. In fact, I didn't even know I was Mexican until about sixth grade. <laughs> so, um, but I always knew that I didn't quite fit in with everyone else that I grew up with. When I was 17, my father took me to my very first trip to Mexico. We went to Mexico City. And in fact, that summer I stayed with a family member and to, so that I could learn Spanish. And I had a very difficult time. I, um, it was a very lonely experience. I felt very isolated. I could not comprehend the language as fast as I had hoped. Uh, I also got sick, like a tourist. Uh, and that's when you really miss home, when you just want to be someplace comfortable, you want to call your mom. Uh, I felt lonely, I felt disconnected. And I realized years later that, think about immigrants that come to this country. When they come here, they too feel very lonely. They feel isolated. People are judging them because they don't speak the language perfectly. They're not getting every joke. They're not understanding all of the situations. So I realized that the first and the second generation and myself, we have parallel experiences. While they are crossing physical borders, I was crossing psychological borders. And so I had to think about the, what I had to really do was learn how to de-assimilate. I had to move away from my Americanness and find a way to embrace 
my, my mother culture. And I cannot give you an exact formula for how to do that. I, all I can do is share some of the things that I tried that have helped me to reconnect uh, with my cultural back background. Well, one of the first ways that I did that is I started talking to my family. I started asking them questions. Tell me about grandma and grandpa. Tell me about our family history. In college, you know, I did a, a family biography. And I found out, quite to my surprise, that I was actually related to somebody famous. Um, I found out that my grandfather uh, was the founding member of Trio Los Panchos. And this is him right here. He's the chubby guy in the middle. You'll notice we have the same nose. Him, myself, and my father, we all have the same nose, so there's no denying this lineage. Uh, I had no idea. Um, and apparently, he had over a 50-year recording career. And at one point, this group sold more albums than Elvis Presley. Yeah. And yes, he's on YouTube as well, so you can find his music everywhere. <laughs> and um, what's interesting is that I never met him until a few years before he died. I only met him one time in my life. So that opened the door of this curiosity. And once I found out who I was and who I was related to, that kind of gave me a better sense of where I came from and that connection. Um, of course, food is another way to reconnect with the culture. My mother certainly did make some of the traditional meals that she was raised with. She taught me how to make homemade tortillas, although my brother teases me because mine still look like the shape of Texas. They're not perfectly round at all. I have lots of practice <laughs> to go. Um, also, through um, other music and art, I found out my paternal grandfather also was a musician. Now, he wasn't famous, but he never could learn to read or write music. But you give him an instrument, and within an hour, he could play it. And so he always played at bars on weekends. Uh, that was his money for, for beer. And then um, the most important thing that I did was I started a student club at Richland College where I teach. Uh, and in fact, it started with this student here. This is Raul. He's kind of our founding father, as we like to call him. He came to, he was one of my students in my history class, and he came to my class, to my office one day, and he said, Ms. Navarro, there are no clubs that represent Latinos on campus. It was very indignant. I said, okay, so let's start a club. And that's exactly what we did. And in the beginning, we had no idea what kind of club we were going to be. Uh, we had to figure that out. And I noticed that in talking to my students, they had similar struggles that I did. They felt very lonely going to college. When you're the first in your family to go to college, family members don't understand what you're going through. Many of them, like myself, were not taught Spanish in the home, so they could relate to someone that had to deal with that stigma and that challenge. Others, uh, I have DACA students, I have international students who also, when they come to this country, feel lonely and isolated. And I found the best way to really embrace my heritage was to give back to a group of students that are also looking for this themselves. And so we have started doing a lot more uh, cultural events. Uh, our biggest one is in the fall. We uh, make the sugar skulls for Dia de los Muertos. So we talk about Day of the Dead, we do a presentation, and we've learned to honor the loved ones that have passed on from us. And through that process, now we're, every year now, we're honoring them. We're making the altars, uh, we're teaching other people about uh, our cultural heritage. This semester we're going to do uh, Cinco de Mayo, we're gonna make the piñatas, we're gonna make the paper flowers. And so there are many aspects, many ways that you can try and reconnect with your culture. And one of the benefits is doing this with my students. I'm seeing them go on to graduate. I'm still in touch with many of these students, seeing them move on to bigger and better things, but they still have this grounding of where they came from and who they are. Now, I'd like to end with a poem by Gloria, Gloria Enzandula. And she says, to live in the borderlands means you are neither Hispana, India, Negra, Española, Nigaracha, eres mestiza, mulata, half-breed, caught in the crossfire between camps where carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which side to turn to, run from. To live in the borderlands means knowing that the Indian you, betrayed for 500 years, is no longer speaking to you. That Mexicanas call you rajetas, that denying the Anglo inside you is as bad as having denied the Indian or black. Now, sadly, Gloria Anzandula is not with us anymore. She died from complications to diabetes. But she was not worried about the future. She said, there will be a fifth race in the future. And it's the cosmic race 
the home of Atlan, which is the ancient home of the Aztecs. She said, someday we will be so blended that we won't have these distinctions of us versus them, uh, legal or illegal, American or non-American. We will be so mixed, we will be mestizos. And so my final quote from Gloria, she says, to survive the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras, be a crossroads. And my challenge is to you, as, as you live your life, you yourself must be a crossroads. Thank you. Thank you.